Thank you for your kind words of welcome, Dr. Moeller. It's wonderful to be with you all. My favorite thing that you said, Dr. Moeller, were the names of my father, my wife, and my daughter. And friends, it's a joy to be with you all here this morning. And the title of our sermon this morning is, Your Love for Jesus is Fragile but Unconquerable. And we're going to be looking at John 21 15 through 23. So that's the title, and that's actually kind of my main point too, and it's kind of my application as well. So it sounds like our job here is done. Go in his peace. (laughs) I caught a freshman or two there like, sweet, this is awesome. (laughs) No, we actually need to look at the text and see if this is true and how this is true from the word of God. So let me ask the Lord to be with us and to aid us in that very aspiration. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, who was the expression of your love for us and for your Holy Spirit sent by Jesus Christ to communicate this love to us in a way that indwells us and fills us and carries us. So Father, I pray that as a result of this morning, we might love you more thoroughly because we more thoroughly trust your love for us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Michelangelo's David is superhuman. You've seen the pictures of the sculpture, I know, and some of the pictures have a leaf very strategically placed in certain parts. But whether you've seen that or not, this, this, this statue stands 13 feet tall. It's a colossus. It's made out of a single giant block of marble hewn from the quarries of Carrera and transported 90 miles. It took two days to get this block. I'm sorry, two days, two years. That would have been fast. <laughs> two years to get this block of marble from its location under the mountains to Florence where Michelangelo eventually would carve this into the finest piece of art perhaps ever produced by one single artist. Michelangelo would use chisel and hammer to shape that block and to form a man. If you've ever seen it, his stance is incredible. It's powerful. It's it's poised for action. The look on his face is determined. But in about 1991, in September, we found out that even a colossus superhuman made out of stone is vulnerable to a madman with a hammer. You see, on that day in 1991, there was a guy who the police later described as deranged who came into the museum that was displaying the Michelangelo's David and he was able to hide a hammer in his jacket pocket and he, w- he moved his way through the crowd and he went up and he just hammered wherever he could find and he went at the left foot of David and broke his toe. The guy's name was Pierre, by the way. <laughs> so I hope that doesn't run in the family. When I first read this story, I was really surprised that something as solid and formidable as a marble statue, a colossus, could be so easily damaged by some unemployed guy with a hammer small enough to tuck away in his jacket. But a book I read recently about faith and art, Russ Ramsey's Rembrandt is in the, in, in the Wind, I'd, I'd recommend it by the way, he, he explains it this way. Marble has incredible compressive strength, but not very impressive sheer strength. So compressive strength means that marble held the weight of mountains. Uh, 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 the, what's, the Italian Alps is what it's called. It held the weight of mountains for countless years without any sign of fragmenting. Compress it all you want. Marble's not going to budge. Marble, in that sense, is unconquerable. But sheer strength is, the, is how well a material will resist being struck. And because of the crystalline structure of marble, when you strike it, like with a hammer, it'll burst. 
So marble, in a sense, is fragile. And I think that illustrates this morning something that we're going to learn about the Apostle Peter's love and thus about our love for Jesus Christ. And so my, my hope here, side note, is to display for you what a rich theological reading of Scripture does to produce rich experiential application. So if you've taken me for a class, you know this is my jam. This is my favorite tune, okay? The richer the theological reading of the text, the richer the application to your lived experience. That's my hope. And so our text this morning, as you probably are familiar with, begins with a story. It's rich, a rich story of the resurrected Jesus at the beach. And he's watching his unknowing disciples out there trying to fish, waiting for them to come in, only they're not catching anything. You know this. So he shouts out to them, hey, throw your nets over the other side. And they throw it, they obey him, and suddenly they have more fish than they can handle. They finally make their way back to the beach, and Jesus is sitting there already prepared with a breakfast fire to receive the fish and bread all laid out. And then he has this conversation with the Apostle Peter, which, which in John's Gospel is the first prolonged conversation he has with him since before his death. And our, our, our text here is going to actually fall naturally into two sections. And so what I'm going to do is give a, one theological observation for, for each section, okay? I'll read them. I'll do that section by section. So let me give you my first observation, and then we're going to read verses 15 through 19. Here it is. The sincerity of Peter's claim to love Jesus was not the basis of their relationship. Rather, it was the power of Jesus' claim to love Peter. Let's read this together. When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. You've probably heard a lot of sermons on this three-peat question that Jesus asked to Peter, do you love me? And you've probably heard pointed out that these three questions in one sense parallel Peter's three denials. Remember those denials? Remember how Peter cracked under the weight of the social pressure of a slave girl recognizing him and accusing him of being one who follows Jesus. And then he swears condemnation on his head. No, I am not one who follows Jesus. I am not one who knows Jesus. I am not one who loves Jesus. A fragile, fragile love for Jesus. So maybe we should read this. Should we read this now as, as the resurrected Jesus posing these three questions to Peter to give him sort of an opportunity to reverse his claims about their relationship? So for each time Peter claimed to not follow Jesus, now he's giving him an opportunity to say, I do follow you. I do love you. Should we read this text as a God of second chances kind of text? Well, friends, I actually think there's something true to that. God is a God of second chances and third and fourth and a billionth, okay? That's true. 
But I believe John's point here is actually much deeper than that and richer than that because a theological reading of John's gospel where we trace the main themes and and his concerns, it shows that Jesus here was wrapping up some business that was still open from prior conversations. Jesus wasn't merely giving Peter another three at-bats in order to up his batting average. Jesus was not giving Peter a chance to reestablish his confidence in his own claims. He was doing something much more painful and actually much more confidence-inspiring. You see, Jesus was showing Peter that Peter's claim to love Jesus was never the basis of their relationship. Rather, it was the power of Jesus' claim to love Peter. How do I know this? How do we know this? Well, let's make a couple observations of these themes in that conversation we just read. Here's the first one, love for Jesus. It's the main theme of all of Jesus' questions. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And each of the three questions was answered by Peter, yes, Lord, I love you. You know this, Lord. So love is this main theme. Peter insisted that his love should have been obvious to Jesus. He was asserting a claim of his dedication. But this wasn't the first time that he had asserted a claim of his dedication to Jesus, as we're about to find out. So that's one theme. The the, the next theme running in that text is is love for God's people. Every time Jesus said, do you love me? And Peter responded, yes, Lord, you do. I do love you. What was Jesus' response to that? Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. Jesus' response actually should not have surprised Peter. Jesus was telling him that love for him displays is displayed in love for one another, love for my people. So love for Jesus, love for his people. The next thing we see in this conversation is this language of laying down his life. Because immediately after they have this three-peat conversation, That's when Jesus launches into truly, truly, I say to you in verse 18 and 19. When you were young, you used to do whatever you want. When you're old, the time you actually should be more free to do whatever you want, it's going to be the opposite for you. In other words, you're going to die a martyr. You're going to lay down your life for me. And by now, it should have been ringing bells in the back of Peter's brain. Like deja vu. Wait, 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 wait. We've, we've, we've said this phrase to each other before. And then, fourthly, the fourth observation of th- this conversation, after that dark description by Jesus, he suddenly ends the conversation with this command, follow me. Follow me. And that should absolutely have popped in Peter's memory. I know we've talked about this before. You've said those words to me about laying down my life and about loving your people and about loving you. So in this conversation at breakfast on the beach with the resurrected Jesus, Jesus is tying together, love me, love my people, lay down your life for me and follow me. And our writer, John, the apostle John who wrote this gospel he, he pulled these four strands together already in a conversation between Peter and Jesus. It actually happened the Thursday evening before Jesus was betrayed, the very same night that Peter would actually abandon and deny Jesus. They had this conversation. In fact, it's worth flipping over briefly. Go back a couple pages to chapter 13. To chapter 13, I want to read verses 33 through 38. Little children, yet a little while, and I'm with you, he tells his disciples. You'll seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, 
you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Pretend there's no heading there in your Bible, by the way. That's not inspired. Keep reading. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow after. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Does that burn in your soul when you read that and make that connection? Here, Jesus and Peter are talking about these themes prior to Jesus' death. He's there, he's there telling them, listen, I'm going to leave you to death. I'm going to die. And the one thing I'm commanding you, it's a new command. It's the central command that, that everyone will know you're my followers if you obey. Love each other. And Peter's like, whoa, 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 wait, time out. Where'd you say you were going? Because I'm going with you. I'm following you. I'm going to, I would even lay down my life for you, Lord. And Jesus says, do you, do you think you have the ability to love me to that degree? You think you can follow me into the death that I'm about to die for you? And it's then that he informs Peter that Peter's love is so fragile that it's going to break at the smallest stroke. Jesus was saying to Peter, it's not your claim to love me that has the power to face death. It is the claim of my love for you that alone has the power to face death. And in fact, it was only a couple minutes later in the conversation in John 15 where Jesus says the very famous saying that you all know and probably even have memorized, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends and you are my friends if you keep my commandments and this is my commandment that you love one another. So now, fast forward to breakfast on the beach three days later. Jesus is bringing up all these themes again, but with one key difference. Now he had died. And now he had been raised. And his love accomplished something. Something that was needed for Peter's heart to be transformed to be capable of loving Jesus in return. Jesus had made the sacrifice on his behalf. Jesus loved Peter first. So how do we see this most clearly in our text? Well, think about it this way. You remember in verse 18 and 19 where Jesus seems to be giving this really dark description of how Peter's going to die? It almost sort of feels like a threat. It almost feels like, yeah, Peter, you denied me. You just wait, buddy. The end of your life is going to be bad, bad for you. But that's the opposite of how we should read this. Jesus was prophesying Peter's faithfulness to love him to the end of his days, even at the cost of laying down his life. Jesus was saying to Peter, you really do love me. Your love for me is real and is unconquerable because it flows from my love for you. So we know that Peter's love does prove unconquerable. Because if you think about it for a second, Peter could have shut his mouth and gone back to being a fisherman, minding his own business, not spreading anything, not caring for anybody but himself. But instead, he would live a life of faithful service to God's people and face the consequences of doing that very thing. And that is his death as a martyr. So his love for Jesus was real because it was not sourced in Peter's sincerity, in Peter's strength, 
in his fortitude, in his talents, in his abilities, or anything unique about Peter. The source of Peter's love for Jesus was Jesus' love for Peter. Have I said it enough? And friends, just like marble moved at great cost out of the hidden depths of the mountain and set on display for the world to see in Florence, so it is that Peter's love took on the same properties. It, it, it carried over the same properties of the eternal depths of God's love from which it was drawn. So that's the first theological observation we have from that section. Now I want to give you the second observation from the next section we're about to read. Here it is. Peter's love for Jesus would come with a cost unique to Peter alone. Let's read verses 20 through 22. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them the one who also had leaned back against him during supper and said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Folks, isn't that the most human story ever? Jesus just gets done signaling to Peter, the thing that you once claimed to do and failed to do, you're now going to do by the power of my love for you. He just got done telling him this. And Peter's only hearing, oh no, oh no, oh no. And then he sees John following him and is like, well, what about him? He was playing the comparison game. And if you're familiar with the Gospels, you know that this comparison game was played a lot amidst the disciples. They were actually pretty good at it. One time they had a conversation about who was the greatest and it, and it elicited a rebuke from Jesus. Another time the sons of Zebedee had their mom go up to Jesus and say, hi, uh, could I just have like one little request, one son on your right and one son on your left? But the greatest boast in all that was at one point Peter's. He said, though, all the, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Peter was thinking, they're all chumps, and I'm not. And Jesus just got done saying to Peter, follow me, and Peter turns around and he does the comparison thing. But before you get too judgmental about Peter, I want you to imagine being told, that you will face torture as part of God's designed path for you. That you'll be stripped of dignity and forced into an undesirable position at exactly the time, the end of life, where you should be getting most honor. Imagine being told before your ministry even begins that you would not be gradually benefiting from your labors over time, but rather your life would get harder, you would have less distinction, and you would be less privileged. You also would probably wonder, do all followers of Jesus have to go through that? Does everyone have to lay down their life like I have to lay down my life? I wonder how long Jesus paused after that question. How many steps on the beach did they take? Did they take five or six steps? Or was it even more agonizing than that, 30, 40 steps? Before Jesus answered him. But however long the pause, Jesus' response is arresting. Jesus hammers Peter with the possibility that John, this disciple he was envious of, that John might experience the direct opposite of the prophecy that Jesus had just laid on Peter. If it is my will that he remain until I come, if it's my will that John never faces death, 
if it's my will that John receives all of the benefits but none of the cost. If it's my will that he is the first one to greet me upon my glorious return in the crowds. Goody boy John. The guy who sat closest to Jesus in their last meal. The guy who was able to recognize Jesus before everybody else did. The guy who outran Peter on the way to the tomb. The guy who was quickest to believe when he saw evidences of the resurrection. Goody boy John. And here Jesus was saying, if I want to give John all those benefits that you were hoping for but will never have, what is that to you? You follow me. Hammer strokes. Why would Jesus hammer Peter like this? Well, friends, the same marble that has incredible compressive strength has weak sheer strength. So was Jesus like that madman in the museum trying to break the sculpture? Or was Jesus like Michelangelo who knew what needed to be chiseled away in order to reveal the glory of God's love displayed in in this unique form of this fragile man named Peter? I think you know the answer to that. Maybe you notice that the command, follow me, is repeated. And that's actually what links both of these sections of the narrative together. So this is what Jesus was saying to Peter, stripping all but this away from Peter. Your only business is to follow me by feeding my sheep. And this task will require you to lay down your life in unique ways that are designated for you alone. And that is what it is to love me. This was Jesus' message to Peter. So friends, I just want to acknowledge this entire conversation was directed to the apostle Peter as an individual, as an apostle, It's unique to him. There are aspects of this that are not directly transferable to every Christian. And yet, there are are principles here that can be applied to your experience, all of our experience of following Christ. So I already told you my main application point. It's this. Your love for Jesus is fragile but unconquerable. And in fact... I think the Christian life requires that we never lose sight of both the fragility of our love for Jesus in ourselves and the unconquerability of our love for Jesus in him. So let me say a word about our fragility first. Your love for Jesus is fragile. And one of the main indicators that God will use in your life to remind you of how fragile that love is, is envy. That's what we just saw operating in this text. Envy is often the painful way that God reveals the fragility of our love for him. If your path, if if the path God takes you on is through dark valleys of desperation, of obscurity, of backbreaking and heartbreaking labor, while someone else's path takes them on level walkways of satisfaction, of recognition, of easy work, will you still follow Jesus? Will you still love Jesus? Is your love for Jesus worth laying down your life for? Folks, that might be actual martyrdom, as with Peter. But, but what's, what's far more daily, far more grinding, is that daily death to self 
that is required of you to love God's people. The daily death of seeing others enjoy benefits that are not necessarily promised to you. The daily death of dreams, of the great things you could do and could be, but that is not God's path for you. Friends, that that surge of envy we feel in our hearts from time to time means that we're forgetting the privilege of learning to love Jesus by following him in the path that he has laid out to us. And I just want to say to you, college and seminary are actually uniquely difficult seasons for fighting envy. Because you look around, you're trying to kind of form your sense of who you are and where you're going to go. And and you look around and you see amazing capabilities around you. You see amazing opportunities that God seems to distribute generously to everybody else and kind of stingily to you. I've sat in those pews as a student friend. And you know what else? I've sat in my car at Cherokee Park praying and wondering why God gave this opportunity or that privilege or this role or that thing to someone when someone else who I thought was less deserving who I thought maybe maybe there's something left in God's uh, uh, goodie bag for me But friends, these are the strokes of God's chisel. They're his specialty tool for forming you into a unique display of his glory that is you alone. So by not giving you those things, God is making you into what you ought to be. And his vision, just like a master craftsman, his vision of what you ought to be is better than your vision of what you ought to be. So you can trust him. So if everything that you dream of for yourself happens to someone else, Jesus' question to you is, what is that to you? You follow me. But how can we do this in the face of our fragility like that. Well, that's the second part of the application. Your love for Jesus is also unconquerable. Some of you in this room need to be reminded of this. Perhaps you struggle with assurance of your faith. Maybe you see precious little passion for Jesus in your heart, a passion you more readily see in other people than in yourself. Perhaps you're struggling with a stubborn sin. You hate it. You don't want it to be part of your life, but your repentance always seems so weak and flimsy and void of the power of loving Jesus more. Or perhaps your struggle is with the courage you'll need to face persecution someday. You, you, you read texts like this and you're scared. Am I going to have what it takes to love Jesus when everything is out on the line. Friends, one of Satan's hidden tools in our lives as Christians is cynicism. Cynicism, even about our own love for Jesus. Think about this. Since the days of Job, Satan has gone around accusing and condemning, spreading doubt in heaven and on earth with one cynical question. Can these sinful little creatures actually love God? And Jesus has some words for Satan. You know what's really neat? I didn't even, I, didn't, I haven't yet uh, told you how that conversation at the Last Supper, the very conversation that Jesus predicts Peter's original failure, I didn't tell you how it began and how it ends. Here's how it begins. It's, it's chapter 13, verse 1, if you're interested. It says, now, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And here's how that 
Thursday evening ends in 17 verse 26. It's a prayer from Jesus to his Father in heaven. And he says, I've made known to my disciples your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Friends, the Father loves you with the same love he has for his son, Jesus Christ. And that is, that is a quality material that is now true of you. So take comfort that when you are fearful of how fragile your love for Jesus is, your love for Jesus was caused by Jesus' love for you. It's not your sincerity. It's not your strength. It's not your fortitude. It's not your talents. It's not your abilities. It's not anything unique about you. Your love for Jesus will prove as unconquerable as Peter's because it comes from the same source, the unfathomable depths of God's love for you. So I'll just close with a simple quote of my favorite verse. It's also by the writer John. I keep calling him Goody Boy John. He's actually my favorite biblical writer. You know it. John, 1 John 4.19. We love because he first loved us. So if you've received the love of God by faith, you will love him to the end. Your love for Jesus is hewn from the granite of God's love. And there is a strength that no mountain of suffering will ever crack and fragment. So, friends, as fragile as your love for Jesus is, it is also unconquerable. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this morning, if there is someone in here who has not yet known your love for them, I pray that if there's a heart like that, they would, they would open their heart. They would, they would come to the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for them. They would repent of their sins and believe the promise of his love. And for those of us, Lord, who have walked with you for many months and years and decades, I pray, Father, that you would renew our love for you by strengthening our trust in your love for us. Father, we need you to do this every day so that we can be unconquerable to the end. In your name we pray. Amen.